to close the door. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a very good start because we start exactly on time, which I think sets the standard for the rest of the conference. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you wholeheartedly to this wonderful conference. I saw everyone everywhere signs through the building to the COMIP conference. So we are in the COMIP conference, but those who don't like abbreviations can also say that it's a conference on sustainable and digital competition on the merits. And it is a comparative and interdisciplinary perspective as the title promises us that Kalpana has so nicely put together. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we know that we all live in very exciting times. Just look around you. We see great challenges brought to us by the scary digitalization, robotics, big tech, platforms, AI, cybersecurity risks. It was even on the news this week in the Netherlands that we risk that AI may wipe out the existence of man. It's not a movie. It was very serious people who were claiming that. But we also have real challenges brought by the planetary boundaries, climate change, global extinction, and other catastrophes, pretty radical. And in addition to all of that, we have competition law. Competition law trying to deal with all of these challenges and competition law asking the question, should we change? How can we deal with all of these challenges? And what does it mean for the shape of competition law? Dear colleagues, Combining all of these, let's say the global challenges in sustainability and digitalization and competition law for one person is virtually impossible. There is only one person who can do that and she is called Dr. Kalpana. She brings all of this knowledge together in her publications and also in this challenging conference that she put together and you saw in the program, it provides interdisciplinary and comparative perspectives. Now, she's really the grand lady who organizes this whole conference. You may therefore ask, Michael, what are you doing there? If she organized everything, why do you do the welcome work? Well, there is a very simple answer to that. Kalpana told me honestly, she needed an old gray, serious looking professor who could put on a suit and a tie because that would make the whole conference look a little bit more serious. That's the only explanation for my presence here today, ladies and gentlemen because Kalpana is really the one who brought it all together. It is, ladies and gentlemen, as you saw, a hybrid conference. So people are following us also on the electronic highway. And still, we are having a feeling of being a little bit excited. We still say to each other, how nice is it to see real people, to be able to sit next to each other and without any distancing, and we are enjoying it. And we will even celebrate. We will really enjoy. We are sitting in one of the nicest rooms, I think, of the law faculty, not only because this is the formal building where the provincial parliament of Limburg used to come together many years when it was still in the hands of the province. But in addition, it is one of the buildings where it remains cool, relatively cool, whereas the other buildings here in the building are pretty, uh, the other rooms are pretty horrible. Now, Dr. Kalpana organized wonderful side events for us to make this an attractive event. Even a romantic boat trip, boat trip on the river Meuse. If you stay until tomorrow, you will get on the boat. And tonight, a dinner in a very real romantic place. We go to a Roman bath, the only real Roman bath in Maastricht. So I think that's pretty spectacular. It is nice to see so many people we know, to see friends coming back, old friends from Maastricht coming back to their roots in Maastricht, which is a big pleasure. So I think I saw the program that we will all have a lot of fun and that we will enjoy. There are many exciting panels. You know, ladies and gentlemen, that Dr. Kalpana can be nice, but she can also be very severe. And she provided me very clear instructions. And so I will follow those in order to avoid that I would get the anger of Dr. Kalpana over me. What were her instructions? Here they follow. Each panel consists of three speakers, not being the plenary sessions, but the other panels. The duration per panel is an hour and a half. In other words, exactly 90 minutes. That means for each paper, we have 30 minutes. And now it's important 
presentation is exactly 15 minutes. Then we have a discussion of eight minutes. And if all goes well, we still have time for general comments, seven minutes general discussion. And then Campana writes, tell them all the panels must absolutely run in time. So chairs and presenters, watch your clock. Otherwise, you know what will happen. The place for the panels is mentioned on the very first page. We see that most of them are here. This is called Statenzaal. This is this wonderful place. Then there is also parallel sessions in C1306, which is just down the hall here on the same level. And some parallel sessions are in 0118. That is on the first floor, a bit further down. But there will be student assistants who will guide you exactly in the right direction. So normally all will go well. We are very happy that we also have three plan three keynotes, keynotes by Leanne Wiseman, by Dan Rubinfeld, a very known scholar in the field of law and economics. Welcome. Good to see that you came all the way from Rotterdam and that you made it. Always wonderful to see our speakers coming in. Pim, welcome to Maastricht as well. And the final speech will be given by Martijn Snoep, very important person, was the manager of the largest law firm in the Netherlands and now a very important function at the Competition Authority. So we're very happy that Kalpana was able to seduce all of these important people to hold the plenary lectures. Ladies and gentlemen, I will start by giving the good example. I had 15 minutes. Kalpana, will you note that I only used seven because now we immediately start with the very first plenary session one, which is called Green and Geopolitical Considerations. As you see on the program, I'm supposed to chair that one. And we have no one less than, I may say, our very own Rogier Kramers. Now, Rogier, for me, is very important. Why? He has been my teacher of Chinese. I'm not going to try my Chinese because I would embarrass him. But in addition to being an excellent, I would say, almost native speaker, the Chinese can confirm of Chinese, he is also an excellent scholar in many domains from competition law, privatization, a very broad interest. And now uh, University of Leiden, at least the last time I talked to him. And at this moment, I am very happy that he returned to his roots where he defended his PhD in Maastricht. Rogier, you have heard the rules. You have 15 minutes. And then Professor Niels Philipsen has eight minutes to discuss. Rogier, please come ahead and take the floor. Be the best. I have been informed that I have a loud and carrying voice, uh, but I think I will still need to use the microphone for the people who are following uh, online, correct? Um, thank you very much, Kalpana and Elke and everybody on the team uh, for your invitation. Thank you, Michael. It is very good to see you again. And indeed, as an old timer, may I remark that your tie is surprisingly serious for your doing indeed. <laughs> Normally, I could, I, I could come to a conference and be reliably certain that I would always only be wearing the second funniest tie, but uh, those days apparently are over. Um, and thank you indeed to Dutch traffic, which cleared up for me enough to uh, drive over here from Leiden on time. Coming back to Maastricht always feels a little bit like returning home. As Michael said, I defended my PhD here in the spring of 2012. Uh, then I was working on China and intellectual property rights. But at the same time, I hope you will forgive me that uh, if, uh, uh, when I say that in this competition, I also feel a little bit out of sorts. Because the problem is that, you know, I do Chinese legal research. And where very many people would focus on doctrinal as aspects of law or how does the Chinese legislator define particular terms? How do Chinese courts interpret particular terms? You know, the, the, the bread and butter of, shall we say, hardcore black letter legal research. What I try to do a little bit more is sort of focus on the China aspect of Chinese law. Uh, currently I'm housed in a humanities department uh, China studies section. So essentially, my, the, the main question leading my research is not what does this tell us about law, but what does this tell us about China? 
So what I'm going to try to do today is invert that a little bit and think together with you about what Chinese evolutions in the regulation, most notably of the large platform companies that have come to dominate its online sphere. We've seen a massive regulatory campaign taking place against them starting in the autumn of 2020. What does that tell us uh, about more broadly how we can think creatively about developing what I think is really necessary comparative perspectives, not just about competition law, but even broadly what markets are. And this is one big starting point that I that I think we really need to think about. Uh, you know, uh, let's make no bones about it. The People's Republic of China is a one party state governed by the Communist Party of China, which isn't committed to any particular form of socioeconomic organization. Rather, it creatively use, uses particular mechanisms and forms of socioeconomic organizations as instruments to realize its broad political goals. And what I'm going to argue is that the development of competition uh, law in and, and more broadly market regulation in the online platform sector reflects a shift in priorities that is happening in China and which therefore are to a very significant degree China specific. But at the same time, those evolutions are not just taking place in China. And many of the factors driving them aren't just taking place in China. And so what we will see is similar evolutions taking place in other jurisdictions, very often in similar ways, um, which then can hopefully, and if any one of you wants to co-write that article with me at some point, I'd be very open to, 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 to doing that, which opens up, uh, I think, ideas from a legal comparative perspective. So empirically speaking, what is it that we're talking about? From about the autumn of 2020 onwards, the Chinese government has issued one piece of legislation and regulation after another targeting China's large platform companies. Some people call this the tech crackdown. And this is part of a standard narrative which one sees very often in media, but also, uh, but, but also in, um, uh, in academic discourse about how this is essentially uh, the Chinese leadership responding to political risk, right? These, these large companies, they're getting far too powerful. They're becoming a threat to Xi Jinping. Uh, Jack Ma is a little bit too flamboyant. Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba and later of Ant Financial. Uh, so essentially the empire strikes back. What I argued in the paper underlying this presentation, which you can download from SSRN is to only look at this from the lens of political risk, I think is far too narrow. The Chinese government is actually trying to achieve policy objectives here. And these policy objectives are informed by a changing perception of the nature of development and of the role of economic growth in that. And I think we have criminally underestimated this in our analysis of Chinese politics, which tend to focus just on, you know, Xi Jinping and authoritarians are gonna authoritarian. And what I would argue is, um, and what I would, would argue, having read, translated, analyzed dozens of these pieces of, uh, uh, of legislation is, um, there's actually a shift that's occurring in the way that the Communist Party understands its tasks, understands the circumstances which it, within which it works, and it responds to that. And obviously we can have a very long discussion about you know, whether that is the optimal response. That's not the question that I'm asking. What I'm asking is where does this come from? And it comes from a number of factors that all make the Communist Party realize that the focus on economic growth, which has been its prime concern since the late 1970s, is no longer appropriate. Right. Since the 1970s, the Communist Party of China has essentially had two priorities. Stay in power, obviously, maintain the integrity and the authority of the regime. But that's pretty much true for any party or individual in power. So it's not really analytically useful to maximize economic growth, whatever the cost. And that has been extremely successful. In 1992, Chinese GDP per capita was about 450 US dollars per capita. Last year, it was about $12,000. Um, but that means that a lot of goalposts have shifted. 
right? A lot of the easy things that China could do to grow GDP, it has done. They are no longer available. Uh, that focus on GDP has come at costs. It has come at an environmental cost, but it has also come at social cost, inequality, and all the rest of it. Uh, in the meantime, people's expectations are changing. Human beings have the unfortunate characteristics of being hedonically adaptive, right? Tomorrow, tomorrow's, uh, what was it? Yesterday's aspiration becomes today's reality becomes tomorrow's baseline. So, in, so uh, and what we are seeing is that a growth model that is based on essentially the success of financialized Anglo-Saxon capitalism, because that's where China exports to, you know, the moment that the financial crisis hits, that comes under threat. And so China spends a good part of the last decade finding a new way forward in how it needs to deal with development. And how does it do so? Well, uh, it uh, first, it uh, essentially officially reprioritizes. I could give you a long ideological discussion about how this works in Marxist theory, but you've barely come out of bed. I don't want to send you back there. Um, but the point is the Communist Party itself says economic growth, it will still be important, but it is no longer going to be the sole priority. We are also going to prioritize other aspects of social well-being, and we are going to try and solve many of the imbalances uh, that have emerged. Uh, in our economy. That has all kinds of very difficult political consequences. What that means, though, is that you can no longer simply say that because a company generates GDP that the government should let it slide, right? Government departments up and down the hierarchy are tasked with balancing uh, growth considerations with other considerations. And I would argue that the regulatory campaign that we see against the platform company is the first major manifestation of this political shift, uh, which is ratified at the 19th Party Congress uh, of 2017. And that's really after 2017, that's where you already start seeing the buildup that then, you know, really explodes uh, in, in, in 2020. Um, the second element is that China comes up with new industrial policy, a new economic policy, an economic policy in which essentially market mechanisms are still used, but markets aren't held up as king. And one very clear way in which we see this is the attention that is increasingly being put on, in the words of Xi Jinping, preventing the chaotic expansion of capital. The Communist Party has learned that uh, from the great financial crisis, the Communist Party has learned that uh, if the financial system becomes a locus of capital accumulation in its own right, rather than the handmaiden of the real quote unquote economy, uh, that leads to instability. And if you are a somewhat competent authoritarian single party state, instability is the very thing you do not want. Right? You want to prevent macroeconomic risks. You want to prevent the enormous uh, buildup of systemic instability that resulted in, in our financial crisis in 2008. And so China forswears the financialization of capitalism. So that means that one avenue of growth is simply cut off. It also has major impacts on the fintech uh, sector, uh, but that's a different discussion that we can certainly have over a beer later on. So what then happens to the platform economy? What I would argue is that regulation takes place in six categories. One, stuff the party was going to do anyway, most notably content control. Communist Party of China has been heavily controlling content since before the internet existed. And with every single new form of content generation, production, distribution, generative AI, uh, for content or AI recommendation algorithms for delivery and distribution, every single time there's a new piece of regulation come out, you can, you can put your watch on it, which is also incidentally why China is the leader uh, at this point in time in generative AI regulation. Um, a second element is uh, preventing macroeconomic instability. Uh, China has completely banned cryptocurrencies, for instance, and China has extremely heavily regulated fintech. And why is that? Fintech in, China is quite, uh, fintech in China is quite unique. China, in contrast to the Netherlands, Western Europe, the United States, China didn't have a modern banking system. So fintech companies took on a lot of the roles that banks play here when it comes to payment. 
The government was fine with, with, was fine with payment. That's just moving money around. What it wasn't fine with was extending credit and wealth management, which has an impact on the money supply. And so they moved in very heavily there because essentially you had large fintech companies behaving as unrestricted monopolists, competition law, right? Or unregulated monopolies and oligopolies. And so in essence, this is the first question I think that's really interesting from a competition perspective. When we are in digital markets dealing with new activities, right? Um, how do we understand them? What the Chinese government has done is to say, if it looks like a bank, acts like a bank, smells like a bank, it is a bank, it's not, regu it's not licensed like a bank, we're going to come down on you like a ton of bricks, right? So that is the first question. How do we regulate emerging companies doing businesses? And that can be very impactful, right? The difference between Tesla being worth more than the entire car, uh, than, than the rest of the car manufacturing industry put together and essentially Elon Musk uh, taking a major haircut is the question, is Tesla a tech firm or is Tesla a car manufacturer and actually not really a good one? Somewhat mediocre one. But anyway, second element, which already has elements of competition regulation in there, is um, uh, macroeconomic, uh, uh, macro uh, preventing macroeconomic risk. Third element is dealing with social concerns, right? Uh, protecting the, right, the rights of gig workers, for instance, but also, and again, comparative element here, in a day and age where uh, all the research is clear that, um, that exposure to social media has a phenomenally negative impact on the mental health of uh, people, particularly young people, particularly young women. In China, they say, basta, but then they say it in Chinese, um, and they come in very harshly on requiring all of these apps to have special youth modes uh, and much stricter content uh, regulations. Um, that brings us to number four, and that's actually a really interesting consideration when it comes to industrial policy which is to say that the Chinese government essentially wants to incentivize these companies to invest in actual technological uh, development. Uh, because what does the Chinese government say? It's very nice that you can now order your food on your phone or you can do all of this e-commerce, but essentially this does not generate meaningfully important new sources of growth, right? This is just displacement. It doesn't really make a difference to the economy whether you order your 50 RMB t-shirt online or whether you go to a shop and buy it, right? It's just displacement of activities and the way, and the way that platforms make money is essentially by taxing convenience, right? They're extractive rather than additive. They're massive companies. We now want them to invest into actual technological breakthroughs and competences that will generate the, uh, the overall uh, th that will that will increase the overall competitiveness, efficiency, and productivity of the Chinese economy in the times to, uh, to come, particularly, and here we come to category number five, at a time of geopolitical risk, right? What the Chinese government tries to do is severely limit the geopolitical exposure of these companies by strictly limiting them uh, listing on foreign stock exchanges and, for instance, imposing very severe rules on uh, data and personal information export. So what we see here is a, 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 the imposition of severe constraints on what companies and business models can do, market shaping uh, exercises on the one hand for the sake of industrial policy, on the other hand for the sake of securitization, which believe you me, is going to be the dominant factor in anything innovation related over the next 10, 15 years. And then we come to the last and most important factor uh, from the perspective of this conference, and that is market regulation and much of it is EU style where indeed China tools up its fairly newly established competition regulator, the State Administration of Market Regulation, and suddenly they start acting. Suddenly they start imposing fines for companies having gone through mergers and acquisitions without having reported them. Suddenly we start seeing all sort of, uh, all, all sort of um, moves against complaints against platform companies uh, abusing their dominant position. For instance, by forcing third-party merchants who operate on those platforms, uh, uh, e contracts are called in Chinese, uh, choose one from two. So that means that if you're running an, uh, an e-commerce shop on an Alibaba platform, you are contractually prohibited from also operating one on Tencent, right? 
And what we see here is the Chinese government, what the Chinese government is trying to do is actually read, uh, is redistributive. It essentially says that this abuse of a dominant position means that uh, all of these large platform companies are making money by sucking all, all, out of, uh, all the oxygen out of the room from these merchants who, who should be making a lot more money than they are, right? Rebalancing, rebalancing uh, income distribution from these economies. So it is competition for, uh, shall we say, almost social democratic uh, purposes, or, or at the very least, redistributive purposes. There is competition regulation for the purpose, as I said, you know, with these mergers and acquisitions, competition regulation for the purpose of avoiding killer takeovers. Because essentially what happens is that these large platform companies will buy startup competitors against which they might have to compete. But if they buy them, you don't have to. You know, you slow the pace of innovation, but that's not your problem. Beijing, however, does see it, see that as its problem. What you also see is uh, competition law as a technological uh, 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 as a technological intervention to prevent lock-in effects. Uh, you may have heard, heard of walled gardens. You know, if you have an iPhone, you are obliged to get your apps from the App Store, and the App Store actually has quite, quite strict requirements and quite high charges uh, for your app. China was a lot worse, right? You could not open a link to an Alibaba web shop in a 10 cent social media app. And uh, again, this is what we're also see, uh, seeing in Europe. China goes far more. It is mandating far more technological compatibility, interoperability, data portability between systems in order to uh, make it far easier for this whole digital sphere to be interoperable. So these are just some illustrations that I wanted to give about how competition law has been used in China for very instrumental goals that are informed by a deeply political context. I'm sure, in fact, I'm reviewing a paper tomorrow that will go more deeply into some of the specific uh, legal mechanisms. And I look very much forward to that discussion. What I just like to throw at you is, you know, what is the comparative question here? And I think there are a couple of things that we can think about. One, there is a very clear family resemblance between what the European Union is doing and what China is doing. The European Union's GDPR and the, and the Chinese personal information protection law look like cousins. And many of the competition uh, regulations and other market regulations in China bear a clear family resemblance to the Digital Markets and Services Acts, albeit founded on completely different principles. I think we can safely say that the fundamental right of privacy means something different in China. I, I think that there is a lot of fertile uh, potential there for comparative research, particularly as the dominant focus of research is still with the US, which in very many ways is the backward outlier here. The second thing is how do we think about these digital markets, where increasingly what we see is what I'm calling for the time being the process of grand normalization, where we're no longer saying these things are tech firms, but these things are firms and we're going to treat them as such. So you can no longer, if you're Uber, you can no longer sort of say, oh, we're a tech firm. We have a different employment model. No, your drivers are employees and you're going to treat them as such. Is there something in there in this broader process of normalization where we can make a theoretical contribution? With that, uh, I hope you found this useful and interesting. Uh, thank you again for uh, uh, the invitation and I look forward to the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Rohir, uh, you haven't changed, and I'm very happy for that, to see that still you stand there, you walk around, and during 20 minutes instead of 15, but that's a detail, you provide us a wonderful overview of everything we always wanted to know about China and all the recent developments. Fascinating stories, I'm sure we can come back to it during the debate. I enjoyed it very much. Wonderful structure. And now we listen to some comments by Professor Niels Philipse, connected to this institution and Erasmus School of Law. Thank you <clears throat> very much, Michael, and also Rohir, for your presentation and your paper, which I, of course, read with uh, great interest. I'm standing here now rather than walking around because I'm looking at some notes. So uh, my job was to discuss your paper. Um, of course, first and foremost, it was a, a very nice and interesting read, Rohir, as always. Um, 
you put a bit more competition law in your presentation than was actually in the paper. But that's okay, because I'm actually, I thought, how can I discuss a paper like this, right? Because who here knows what's going on in China. Um, I learned from it, right? It, it's mostly sociological, it's political science, uh, at least what, what I read in the paper, not so much economics, but there is of course quite a bit on the legal developments there. Um, there is one conclusion though that I uh, share very much with you and uh, which is one that you didn't highlight today, but it's actually the conclusion of your paper, which is that uh, you mentioned it, uh, what happened in China is not really a tech crackdown, it's rather a rectification. The paper's title is even the, the great rectification, right? And well, in me as a discussion, probably you find someone who already agreed with you. <laughs> uh, so that makes it also difficult for me to, uh, to go against that conclusion. So I'm not going to do that. Uh, actually, I, I agree. And I see that many colleagues and also many commentators in the media think about this differently, but there are many underlying reasons that you presented nicely in the paper and also today. Uh, that explain that it's actually a part of a trend. It's not something sudden uh, that, that happens in, in China. So what am I, am I going to do then in the few minutes that I have here? I thought I'm going to extend a little bit on the competition law part, right? I, you discussed more of that uh, today, but what I'm proposing here is something uh, different. I will also ask you two questions at the end. So um, what I'm going to do is compare a bit uh, the the, Chinese competition law, uh, where it stands and how it develops with uh, compared it to the EU's situation. Um, we did some research, a former PhD researcher of mine, Wu Chen, known to quite some people in the room and me about uh, the, the Android case, the Google Android in the EU that everyone knows, right? So it's on tying. And it's the Tencent case, Tencent Chi Ho case, which is also on tying. Uh, tying uh, virus uh, scanners uh, to instant messaging uh, uh, services. And Tencent is the, the huge company, Rohir already referred to it, behind WeChat and all of these uh, platforms. Interestingly, the Chinese outcome there was uh, quite lenient and in line with what economists would predict, actually. Um, so it was lenient on the companies. Uh, and we know that in the EU, the Google Android case was decided differently. Now, what, why do I pick up this? Uh, it's just two cases. Of course, you cannot draw conclusions from just two cases. We looked at several others as well. But what I'd like to share with you is our explanations, why the Chinese, this was before the great uh, rectification, uh, were milder, seemingly milder on the, their own big tech platforms than the EU uh, was at foreign big tech uh, platforms in, in the Google Android case. Um, I have to also to uh, tell you that this case in China was uh, dealt with by the Supreme People's Court. So it was a private enforcement case. But what we actually found for many of the cases happening in China is that there was a tendency until recently to avoid false positives, right? Because, um, and we had lots of proof for that. There was a higher threshold for proving foreclosure of competitors. So for a, a, a dominant undertaking, it was easier to, to get away, right? Uh, also, proving pro-competitive effects of your practices was easier in China, easier to justify under the Supreme People's Court test than what we see in the, uh, the Commission's approach in several of these cases. Um, so the avoidance of false positives was a conclusion we, we, we were drawing in this paper. Um, why? Well, China is a late starter, both in competition law, right? The AML competition law was introduced in 1998. Also in the regulation of digital markets, even though they do go all the way now, uh, clearly. I agree with uh, Rohir on that. Uh, so probably because they were a late starter, um, they accepted economics from the beginning. In the EU, of course, we know EU competition policy is probably the least economics based if you compare that to the US, but also with China. Uh, in China, it was easier to do. They didn't have to care about internal market goals, right? From the beginning, they could just look at practices both from the EU and from the US. And in that sense, uh, maybe you can also conclude that the, avoiding the risk of false positives in line with some economics, efficiency defenses and all of that can be explained. Um, Right, and the EU policy, I don't have to tell anyone here, was, is still based to a large extent on the order liberalism and uh, internal market policy. Right, um, also in, in China, 
strangely, I mean, we say uh, they are more in line with economics predictions. That doesn't mean that they used economics a lot, right? We found actually that because there was not so much experience in the Supreme People's Court, uh, but also in the agencies up until recently, there was a lack of staff, right? So now we have the SAMR, so th this is a huge organization, but always the problem in China has been too little money, too little people, right? So um, that explains at least until recently uh, what happened. Um, also generalist judges dealing with these cases in China and not specialized uh, courts. Uh, and then, of course, we, I fully agree with we here that uh, the intervention in China also often happens for paternalistic reasons rather than uh, other criteria. You didn't stress that today, but in the paper you were very clear on that, like the, the state tries to do good for its people, right? It really has the best of intentions, even though well, we would call it uh, paternalistic. It's not necessarily bad, it's just a different uh, approach. Although it sometimes has uh, strange consequences, sometimes it has good consequences. So protection of citizens. So um, avoidance of false positives, limited staff, the fact that the, the competition law was introduced late uh, led us to explain these differences between the EU cases that we looked at and the Chinese cases. Um, there's another element I can add in Kana Jiang is in the room, which has to do with uh, the, the type of regulation that China is using still today if we look at competition and the regulation of digital markets, right, there's a lot of law that's on data protection, uh, it's on privacy, on algorithm recommendations, so on the technology itself. But if you look at um, what we have in EU, the DMA, a Digital Markets Act, something like that is not hard law in China, it's actually still soft law. There's, a, there's a guidelines on, a platform, uh, on the platform economy. So here we see indeed, a, again, a proof that the competition law is a bit outside of that system of, 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 of hard law, at least for the abuse of dominance uh, practices and all of that. Um, right, so basically th that brings me to my two questions. Uh, I will finish up here and leave uh, for uh, some room for others to reflect on this. So do you agree with, with, the first question is, do you agree with my interpretation that competition law is, is indeed a separate area um, that all of the, 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 let's say, rectifications mm -hmm. are mostly outside of that, right? Outside of competition law proper anyway. Uh, so more to be found in data protection, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The other one is more a question out of my personal interest. I wrote it down after reading your paper. Uh, the changing goals in China, right, introduced by the 14th five-year plan quite recently. You uh, mentioned it today. So until recently, there was an exclusive focus on GDP growth, right, which also explains some of the, the policies. But now the targets officially also include uh, economic equality, even environmental, uh, national security, and others, right? So my, my simple question here is, because you presented like a choice, uh, you are the, the expert, of course, and on, the, on political development. So out, out of my personal interest, was it really a choice or was it a necessity uh, for China to, to make this change from a focus exclusively on GDP growth and to this growth uh, uh, linked to all these other factors? Was there no other way? In fact, maybe they had to do it, right? Uh, because GDP growth cannot easily be created anymore. So it, it's not really a choice then, right? just going with the flow and changing your policies accordingly. So uh, that's it. I hope it was some, uh, useful. I don't know to whom to give this. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes. I, I would say that we maybe first look if there are other questions because we only have five minutes left for general debate and then give the last word to Rogier to answer and all the questions from the room. Kalpana, can people online also ask questions? They can. So people online, if you have questions in some way or another, then through some magic trick, you can raise your voice or put you something see, in the chat. Put something in the chat. You can see Kalpana if there is something happening online. Yeah. Nothing happening we can, online. We can all see it. We can all see it. We can all see the chat at least. That, is there questions from the room, sir? We will collect all the questions and then give the chance to Rafi. Go ahead, sir. See you. Thank you very much, uh, Rohir, for the wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, I've been struck by uh, 
we want to talk a little bit on uh, industrial policy and the focus on uh, technological uh, breakthroughs. I would like to know uh, from uh, your opinion, what are the implications of that in, uh, with regard to uh, the Chinese uh, interaction with part of the bigger players in the global economy, the US, of course, and, and, and the EU, because they uh, focus on uh, taking advantage of the huge Chinese market also. But on another angle, the developing countries that are players also in the global uh, economy tend to think that the Chinese approach can help them also realize their societal uh, development goals, especially from the economic uh, side. So I'd like to know what uh, you think would be the implications of that and what lessons uh, can other countries learn from China? Other questions to Rob here? Esther, please, lady. Uh, so I had a question about the interpretation of what the competition authority has been recently doing, because uh, you mentioned that there seems to be some distributive or redistributive intent behind it. And one of the big things that we talk about in the EU all the time is the goals of competition law. How do we define, where do we find them, who sets them, and so forth. And I was just wondering whether um, there is any official statement from the competition authority that accompanies, that shows that that's the intention, whether it's your own, own interpretation and what the goals for competition law are in China, actually. Here, please, come on. Thank you for your interesting presentation. My question is that, uh, is that possible for the U.S. and China uh, to learn from each other in regulating the digital markets? Although they may, share, they may have some uh, differences in uh, political analysis, political aspects. Thank you very much. And the first yes, thank you. And the further question is that from your perspective, um, what China can learn from the EU in regulating this uh, big tech forms and what's the Brussels effects towards China mm, yeah, in, in the development of digital markets and also in the regulating the gatekeepers in China. Thank, Thank you very you much. Very much. Yes, we need to think about that. We always use the mic. You also had a question? Oh, no, you just take the mic. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> if you're very quick. Um, hello, uh, thank you for your presentation. I'm a PhD candidate uh, specialized in IP at Mass State University. Um, um, I'm very surprised that you pointed out that uh, the, 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 uh, the that, that China uh, has a radical policy change regarding uh, the financial uh, regulating the financial market. And regarding the financial market, um, um, intellectual property um, such as uh, patent and copyright has the tendency to securitize. For example, uh, we've seen recent changes in uh, listing big IPs at the Shanghai Stock Ex Exchange for funding and uh, investment. So where do you see IP in the crackdown uh, or in, 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 the, in the clarification, uh, in, in the regulation of the financial market? Thank you. Thank you very much, Rohit. You have one minute to answer. I'm sorry, Kaltana, you want me to keep time or you want to ask questions? Let's say, be fair and table to all. There's also a question online. Olis, if you may want to unmute yourself and ask the question. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I, I wanted to ask Rohit uh, to what extent it is correct that uh, the Chinese approach to regulating digital markets is somehow, somehow vague by default. It's not like uh, strict, clear-cut rules, but more kind of directions. You are expected to, to understand the, the intentions of regulators. Is it, is it the case? And if so, do we see some elements of transposition of this regulatory philosophy to the to the European regulatory context? In I mean, in, in, uh, in particular articles six and seven, how they are designed to be susceptible to be further specified in, in course of regulatory dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. We have minus one minute <laughs> to answer. So Rohir, try just to summarize and pick out a few highlights 
Otherwise, we're keeping on Tim's time. Yes. All right. Uh, uh, let me preface this by saying I'll be here all day and tomorrow. So uh, I'm going to give you brief answers and I'm happy to continue the conversation. Niels, okay. is competition law a separate field? And, you know, you generously agreed with me. Yes, I agree with you. But a lot of that is due to a learning process where, uh, with regard to the platform economy, at least, it was very clear that there were certain abuses that they want to get rid of straight away. But currently, there is actually some very, very interesting debates going on in China about how to then move forward and what is it that competition law should be steering towards. I can fill you in on some of the debates. Um, changing goals focus on uh, the, the changing goals uh, where we now have different goals. It's actually very different to do, uh, difficult to do in a Leninist party system, which is set up for, you know, organizing around one party line. And it's very, it's not very good at sort of doing trade-offs. Uh, so the, the difficult thing is that many of these debates are a little bit politically charged, which makes them slightly different to see, difficult, uh, difficult to see for us. But it also means that there is a real richness to those debates uh, that we should also take into consideration. Industrial policy implications on China foreign relations. We don't want China to move into those high value added activities that we reserved for us. Thank you very much. That uh, may, means that white people have a, a disproportionate share in global wealth, even though we forget that uh, that wealth is indispensably being connected to not just Chinese market, but more importantly, Chinese manufacturing. So there is a systemic issue here. Uh, and when we think, you know, it's Western capitalism, uh, China was always inextricably part for that. From developing countries, uh, actually, there's interesting uh, research out that, that suggests that China's industrialization has essentially also taken industrialization away from other developing countries. So there clearly is a very interesting double dynamic going on there. Uh, Interpretation of uh, competition authorities. How do they interpret? Uh, how do they interpret their mandate? Is that how I say? Well, again, you know, this is what's this is the debate that's been going on now. Having sort of clearly regulated against some very manifest abuses and problematic practices, they are now sort of trying to reorient towards sort of peacetime instead of wartime. And the question is now, you know, what do we steer for? Those debates are ongoing. I'll report back when uh, when there's sort of a clear crystallization. Um, is it possible for China and uh, Europe to learn from each other? China has been studying Europe intensely for decades. In fact, uh, I see many more Chinese faces here than I would see European faces at a Chinese uh, conference. The question is not, can Europe study from China? Because increasingly, uh, the answer to me seems yes. The question is, does it want to? And can it recognize that uh, China constitutes uh, an example to be learned from, I think many people in this room would uh, would certainly agree with that suggestion, but at a policy making level, uh, be it in The Hague or in Brussels, uh, I think that that is very much a no go area, unfortunately. Um, what is it that China can learn? Uh, I guess there's no not much more that China can learn. As I said, in very, very, very many areas, China is now currently a uh, a leader. But what you very clearly see is a pattern of learning whereby China tries to use legal modules and fit them in a particular Chinese framework. So the Chinese personal information protection law takes over a lot of components of the GDPR, but obviously without the notion of a fundamental right to privacy, because that doesn't exist in Chinese law. In fact, the very notion of a fundamental right does not meaningfully exist in Chinese law. IP securitization, uh, that is to support the development of the real economy, which is different from financial system, you know, the financial system sort of profit accumulation uh, for its own right. Yes, uh, they're trying to do everything they can to get more investment into IP heavy industry. Vagueness as a regulatory tactic. Absolutely, the Chinese government loves to be vague because if uh, because if it's clear, then there is a risk that people will play what the, what in Chinese legal parlance we call playing a line ball, where you try to drop your ball like in tennis, very close to the line, uh, rather to be vague and uh, trust the natural risk avoidant tendencies in people. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Rafi. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that we had a wonderful opening of the conference. Very nice paper, very nice discussion. We move immediately further to Rotterdam from the Erasmus School of Law, where Associate Professor Pim Janssen is working on competition law and will now present to us on balancing green and digital transition policies with competition law and policy in the EU. And then we listen to Professor Sarah Sulmakers. Pim, go ahead.
Uh, you, you need to take the stick, the, the, the phallus, where is it? Where is, where is this? I think someone had here. Oh, uh, was it Kana who had it or uh, the, uh, the mic microphone? The microphone. Ah, that's it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Bopana, for uh, Bopana. It's not working. Okay. Does it work? Yeah, yeah it works. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you, Kalpana, for hosting this wonderful event again, and thank you for inviting me. Um, so my name is Pim Janssen. I'm an associate professor of uh, a public law in Rotterdam. Uh, I started my studies here at Maastricht University a long time ago, where I did the bachelor's Dutch law and European law school, and then did the master's of was then called law and language studies. Now I think it's called Master of International Laws. Wonderful, wonderful program. Um, last year, I discussed a topic which could have been relevant this year as well. It was about RPM and e-commerce after the uh, founding decision uh, of the Dutch Authority for Consumers and Markets. Of uh, Martijn Stoep will be there tomorrow. Uh, um, uh, and after that, I received a wonderful comments by Niels, who is also sitting here today. Uh, this year, my, my focus will be quite different. I'll be exploring the quite delicate equilibrium that must be struck between, on the one hand, green and digital transition policies, which are both a form of industrial policy and competition law and policy in the EU. And I must say, it has been a pleasure to listen to Rogier about industrial policy in China. And I think it's, uh, it's time that we collaborate together on uh, this. Um, I have a presentation. I have to say I spent more time on the pictures than on the uh, text of the presentation. Um, I'll go now to the first. Uh, Yeah, perfect, perfect. The fact that I focus both on green and digital transition is not a coincidence uh, because it's aligned with EU strategic vision as outlined in its 2020 industrial policy communication on a new industrial strategy for Europe. And in this communication, the Commission laid the foundations uh, uh, for an industrial policy that would support what they refer to as a twin transition to digital and green economy. To make EU's industry more competitive globally, and I know you can, you can have endless discussions on what competitiveness means from an economics perspective, and, and this is also important to enhance Europe's open strategic autonomy. And uh, uh, so there is an important geopolitical element in this. So what is the green transition? It's, uh, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's very broad. Uh, it's it's embed embodied in the European Green Deal strategy and the European climate law, and it seeks to make the EU climate neutral by 2050. And it's, it encompasses a broad range of initiatives. And importantly, uh, uh, this, this transition is not just about mitigating climate change. It also represents an important form of uh, industrial policy. Uh, uh, by transitioning to, to uh, neutral technologies and industries, uh, the EU aims to boast its international competitiveness uh, and also to reduce its dependencies. Um, 
And part of this is uh, the EU, to some extent, put their uh, money where their mouth is. They adopted a, a, a European Green Deal investment plan, uh, uh, which is the financial pillar of the European Green Deal. And it will be supported by the Invest EU scheme. And reference can also be made to the Net Zero Industry Act and the Fit for 55 package that focuses on dark decarbonizing EU industry. And of course, the EU is not alone in that this regard. Uh, other world regions, such as the US and China and other areas, are heavily investing and rolling out support measures to uh, uh, train, change the structure of their economy as well. Uh, uh, for example, the US in, uh, Inflation Reduction Act will mobilize over six, uh, 360 billion by 2032. And Japan's Green Transformation Plan aims to raise uh, 140 billion euro, at least uh, equivalent in Japanese yen. Of course, the digital transition at the same time is about harnessing the power of digital technologies to drive innovation, but also again to uh, 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 for economic growth. So it's also a very important industrial policy uh, uh, tool. As I said, uh, uh, as part of this, it's, it's an industrial policy tool, but at the same time, it's also meant to limit strategic dependencies. Uh, and as, as a case in point, uh, the global semiconductor shortage has really exposed Europeans' dependency on supply from a limited number of countries and geographies. Um, and now with the current conflict in Ukraine, the war there, uh, 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 this has come even more to the, to the limelight. Um, so these are this 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 was all policy. Five minutes of policy, and that's inevitable. But I'm a lawyer, so let's talk about law now. These transformative journeys, this changing of the economic structure, represents a formidable formidable challenge to our traditional understanding of competition law and policy. For instance, how can the state intervene in the market to promote green and digital? Uh, uh, transi transitions. What is the right balance between competition and cooperation in these sectors? Um, because of course, EU's green and digital transi uh, uh, trans transitions aim to modernize and change the structure of the economy, but it must be balanced with competition law to ensure fair markets. And misalignment could actually also impede those transitions. So then we get to the third slide. Um, so it's crucial for both the green and digital transition policies to examine their legal implications within the current framework of EU competition law. Um, for example, and I will just give a few examples, but there are more, of course. The Europe, European Union's Green Deal necessitates extensive collaboration among businesses, both in a vertical context, but also in a horizontal context. And of course, as we all know, or as we all might know, this is, this is a big discussion in the Netherlands. It's also something that Martijn Snoep, uh, one of the key speakers tomorrow, has been working on uh, effortlessly uh, 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 in the last years trying to influence the European Commission to change the notice of fair share under 101 third paragraph. Uh, and we will see later on in my presentation to what extent that has actually worked or not. But of course, yeah, a collaboration could potentially clash with uh, the principles of competition law. So the question is, yeah, how can we foster essential collaboration for environmental sustainability without violating the basic tenets of uh, of competition law and policy. And also maybe a more fundamental question, should we really use competition law to do so? Or are they just stepping in because the legislator aren't acting sufficiently? Um, of course, another aspect of the uh, 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 green technologies is that 
those technologies are often concentrated among a few entities. Think, for example, to make it very small, think about operators of heating networks, heating networks. They are monopolists. How can we present this from resulting in an abuse of dominant position? Uh, of course, the complexities multiply when we talk about the digital transition. And we all know that large tech companies uh, with their dominant market position on different markets, they're vertically integrated, uh, could potentially stifle competition and innovation. So how can we pre prevent exploitation while still discouraging, encouraging digital growth? How can we regulate data acqu uh, acquisition and usage to prevent anti-competitive practices? And when digital companies merge or when innovative startups are being acquired by big corporations, how can we ensure that such uh, merge and acquisition activities do not lead to an unhealthy concentration in power, both in the short run, but also in the long run. And then there's, then there's an extra dimension. Of course, the intersection between green and digital transition presents its own unique set of challenges. Because digital technologies can be instrumental in achieving environmental sustainability, but they can, and this is more a factual point, they can also contribute to increased energy consumption and electronic waste. So how can we advocate for digital solutions for the green transition without exacerbating other environmental issues? And lastly, of course, it's something that I raised already briefly, the role of state aid in both green and digital transitions is a matter of, of course, significant consideration. Um, and while state aid on the one hand can be a very potent, very strong instrument to promote these transactions, it can also distort competition, obviously, in the internal market, but also vis-a-vis -vis third that country, if not appropriately regulated. Um, and then a second point is, yeah, and next question is, how do these new technologies and digital market change the interaction between industrial policy, competition policy, and importantly, lastly, the strategic autonomy. Um, because increasingly, as we all know, new technologies and new markets uh, uh, have raised important questions about strategic autonomy, uh, uh, privacy, but also national security. Because increasingly, non-state uh, uh, actors uh, uh, like industrial or financial or technological firms are also now resorting more and more to the strategic logic of geoeconomics. Um, <laughs> so these and other developments are really paving the way for a new generation of geoeconomic practice and theory. And the question is how to regulate this inside or outside uh, a competition law. And um, well, and able to answer all those questions that are raised, reference can be made, of course, both to competition law and ex ante regulation, uh, uh, where monopolists or parties with high market shares are being regulated to make sure that they operate as if they were competition. Of course, it's very similar to the ex ante regulation that we already saw in formerly monopolized sectors in the economy, like the telecom sector and, and other sectors. And, uh, it, it, and, and, and the fact is, in all of these domains, there are so many new developments which, either, which have a direct or indirect bearing on the green and digital transformation strategies in the context of competition law and policy. And sometimes for a competition lawyer nowadays, it can be almost overwhelming uh, uh, to follow all of them. And for example, yeah, uh, uh, as was already mentioned, the DMA and the DSA, they regulate digital platforms and services, promoting fair competition and innovation. Then there is, for example, the EU CHIPS Act, which, which is a proposal, a quite a recent proposal, to boost semiconductor production with the ambition to turn around, uh, um, uh, to, to make sure that 
uh, uh, it doubles European share in global semiconductor uh, uh, production. And this is very much stimulated by companies like ASML. They wrote position papers on this, um, about the importance. Think, for example, about also the new vertical block exemption regulation and the new guidelines, which provide more clearer rules on some aspects, maybe less clear rules on other aspects, and also focus on digitalization <laughs> and uh, uh, green transition. Think about the revised horizontal block exemption uh, 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 and, and the vertical uh, and the horizontal guidelines, which explicitly state as their aims, encouraging of R and D, uh, 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 and uh, sorry, focus on R and D. Uh, and focus on tree, green transition. Um, okay. <clears throat> one minute. Okay. Um, think also, for example, about the new rules on foreign direct investment. Of course, we all know the EU rules on foreign direct investment, which were not very spectacular, and nothing like the the CFIUS, uh, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the US, which is quite potent, but has resulted in a very strong network of national foreign direct investment systems, including the Netherlands. Uh, it was launched uh, this year. And think about, for example, the foreign subsidies regulation, which prevents distortions caused by foreign subsidies. Um, yeah, I think in my, yeah, I think I'll think I'll leave it here because. Uh, um, the only thing I was still wanted to discuss was the following, was basically the new horizontal rules, which entered into force the 1st of June. So they're very new. Um, and an explicit aim of these new rules is to, uh, uh, is to help the digital and green transition of the EU. And I would say the, the main two takeaways are that first of all, there is now a new uh, uh, block exemption regulation for R&D, very complex one, a very complex one, but for the first time, there is also now a whole chapter on R&D agreements in the horizontal guidelines. Second issue is, and there I will conclude, uh, the second issue is that there's now a new chapter, a full chapter on sustainability. There's a full chapter on sustainability. But if, if you read it through, it's, it, goes, it goes quite far. But in a way, it's also a little bit disappointing. It's a little bit disappointing. Where the Dutch ACM went as far as to say that benefits for society as a whole can triumph. The, ne the negative externalities, the, the negative effect on competition for the consumers in question, to the extent that the consumers in question get the same fair share as the rest of people in the economy. Restrictions on competition for environmental damage agreements are justified. This is not the this is not the case in the uh, Commission guidelines. In the Commission guidelines, consumers still have to be fully compensated for the negative effects on competition. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for this interesting overview of even the most recent developments. Pim, wonderful. We move immediately to Professor Sarah Schoenmakers, connected to this institution with professor at the Open University and the University of Hassel. Please go ahead, eight minutes max. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Pim. Thank you very much. It was a, a very enlightening presentation that you brought us today. It was very up to date, uh, looking into the new guidelines, the new horizontal block exemption regulation. And um, what I particularly like to discuss a little bit more is about the role of competition law. So traditionally, competition law was always seen as uh, there to promote the efficient use of resources to pr protect the economic freedom of companies as well. 
And you now see that it is really pluralist. Right? It has many, many different objectives, for example, sustainability, but also promoting SMEs. It is about fairness. And that is something that we see not only in competition law, but also in many other areas of EU law, such as public procurement law, where this is also very high on the agenda. So we see that companies are now expected to work together to respond to sustainability challenges, um, that they are always stimulated because of the set. You are the ones who can provide important contributions to sustainability. But of course, companies who are then going to react to that, they are often faced with the first mover disadvantages because, of course, uh, making these products sustainable, that costs a lot of money. Consumers are often not aware about the additional added values that there are. So you also always need businesses who have long-term views. So what we do not want is that com competition law is going to be seen as a barrier to these industry initiatives, that competition law is going to punish companies if they make some agreements to promote sustainable products. Um, and that is where these horizontal block exemption regulations and these guidelines come in, because they are actually saying what is allowed. If you make an agreement with another company promoting sustainability, then we are not going to see that this is a violation of Article 101, Paragraph 1, or at least we are going to say that it is justified on the basis of Article 101, Paragraph 3, uh, or on the basis of the specific block exemption regulation. So the whole idea is that if there is more competition, more sustainability is going to be there by nature because you have more alternatives, there's more choice and so on. Uh, but on the other hand, we see that regulatory interventions are still needed. Uh, in essence, they are always considered to be the preferred instrument, um, not only because they can make it happen, all the environmental laws are really hardcore targets. Um, they are also seen, uh, for me at least, they are seen as something that brings about less insecurity. While I think that competition law is always bringing about more insecurity because you don't know what a court, what a European Commission is actually going to say. So you could argue eh, that we still would need to prefer a regulatory intervention before we look at competition law. So when you um, look at competition law, right, it is actually acting from two different points of view. It can be seen as a sword. Some agreements are forbidden. Uh, some sustainability agreements are forbidden. But on the other hand, it is also seen as a shield because under the scope of Article 101, Paragraph 3, these block exemption regulations are actually shielding companies from actually being targeted by a competition authority. And uh, in Article 101, 3, you see that these sustainability concerns are uh, always looked at from a consumer welfare analysis, as uh, Pim also just mentioned. And you see that 90% of all these analysis are actually made by national competition authorities. So most cases are still dealt with at a national level, which again brings about insecurity because you can argue that we do not really have a very fixed view um, in the European competition law uh, field there. But then again, these guidelines are stepping in because they provide national competition authority with some tools, uh, just like also the European competition network, uh, the ECN plus network has uh, many uh, added value in that regard. So when I was thinking about this, uh, I also had to think about a few cases um, one case was um, the case where the German car makers were actually making deals, um, Daimler, BMW and Volkswagen, where they actually colluded to go not above and beyond the legal environmental requirements that we had in EU environmental law. Um, and then they were punished because the commission said this is actually such a violent restriction. It is even an object restriction um, because you could do better, but you don't. Well, you, they actually didn't even have to do better. So then I ask myself the question, do we need competition law? Um, so 
because we don't want companies not to cooperate in a non-sustainable way. And then I thought about this other case. Um, it was the, the case about uh, the Kip van Morgen supermarkets, um, where supermarkets actually made some agreements uh, saying that certain chicken meat would no longer be sold because the animal welfare uh, was not at a high level. Um, and then the Dutch Competition Authority, or the it's the ACM now uh, called, they said that um, that's a very nice uh, incentive that you have. But on the other hand, consumers, they are willing to pay more for uh, animal welfare, uh, but not for these minor changes that are actually made. So they were actually not really uh, been uh, valued. Uh, it was considered um, that they were still violating competition law. And afterwards, it is seen as a good decision uh, because now without these agreements, um, the animal welfare is even higher. So to come back, at when I talked about the German car dealers, my question was, do we need competition law because we don't want uh, companies not to cooperate in a non-sustainable way. The Skip van Morgen case actually came in my mind as the reverse question. Do we need <laughs> to cooperate in a sustainable way in order not to violate competition law? And I'm wondering whether it is the same question or whether it is actually a different question. Eh? Do we need co to cooperate in a sustainable way in order not to violate competition law? Or do we not to cooperate in a non-sustainable way in order not to violate competition law? So um, these are my main questions. Um, very, very short um, is you were saying that uh, the EU is actually aiming to be the first climate neutral uh, continent by 2050. You also refer to the US and Japan. Uh, and I was wondering, uh, we want to be the first, so it still feels as, as if we are ahead of everyone. What is this going to do for the competitive position of our companies? Are we going to expect more spillovers or are we going to face, be faced with a lot of bankruptcies? Um, and then uh, by saying that we are so green, that we are doing so well, we see the commission is often first listening to what do consumers want? Do they really want more green elements? Uh, but on the other hand, all these consultative firms are often paid by the commission. So can we really trust what the consultancy firms are saying? And that is also a very a, a highly living debate at the moment. Um, finally, do we have a democracy, a legitimacy problem? Because all these national competition authorities, they are not democratically elected. They are making huge decisions. And you refer to the Dutch uh, competition authority who actually said, um, we should not care about whether it is good for the consumers, but we have to look at whether it is good for society in general. While the commission, even in the guidelines that you refer to, is still looking at the consumer perspective and not at the at the yeah full uh, yeah uh, the the whole uh, society perspective. So these were my comments. Thank you very much, Ben. Thank you very much, Sarah. We're running a little bit in reserve time, so I'm looking if there are any pressing questions from the room or in the chat online. Then please. Um, the, the mic, the mic. Yeah. Thanks. Um, another question with that? But, Go okay. ahead. Uh, Jiren Novak. Um, I, I just had a, a question, and I think it's something that, that came to me um, while, while you were speaking. And it's actually a, a question that comes up all the time. We always say, well, it's better that the regulator does it. And, I, I, and I'm like, uh, not necessarily guilty, but I, I say sometimes the same thing. But as uh, uh, Pim was talking about this, I was thinking the regulator, the legislator is not regulating enough. That's essentially the claim, the claim. But is that not something that we competitioners just like say so easily? It's this kind of question that we don't ask. Can the regulator 
the legislator regulate all those things? Should they? Um, and I think those those are sometimes questions we forget. Uh, we make it possibly easy for ourselves to say, well, this is not our problem. Uh, that's someone else's problem. And then the comparison between those two problems, we, we don't do that so often. So I was just like wondering whether the legislator can actually regulate all these questions. That's a very relevant question. Thank you very much. One comment here. Okay, thank you. So um, my question uh, and probably uh, the part of the legal side of my question has already been covered by the discussant. However, I was interested whether the um, integration and the sustainability in the competition law and these barriers, how would it um, play the role in the context of the uh, global um, picture for the EU competition industries? So will it be the threshold for a global context or will it just be the um, another barrier to cover and then probably we will succeed there somewhere? Thank you very much. Can we now give one minute to Pim, if he gets the mic to answer the question. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Pim. Thank you. Uh, very pertinent questions. Um, first, to react to, to, to Sarah, I, I, see the, I see the Dutch chicken of tomorrow a little bit different. Uh, uh, so their consumers were unwilling uh, uh, to, to, they didn't sufficiently appreciate the environmental, the, the positive environmental effects uh, uh, for society as a whole in the context of the purchase price. And that's why the, the ACM said no. They got a lot of criticism for it. And I think that's one of the main reasons why they have come up with the, uh, the new guidelines on sustainability where they go a lot further than before. Uh, and it's, it's true, like uh, last year, they, uh, they presented an economic report which said, yeah, uh, we didn't really need that agreement at the time because nowadays there's more sustainable chicken than ever before. Of course, that report doesn't say anything. Maybe it would have been there much quicker already uh, with the agreement. Um, I think a fundamental question and that something that you raised and something that you raised is, yeah, do we need, you said, do we need to use competition for that? And then you said, uh, uh, yeah, but maybe it's too easy to just look to the regulator. I think it's a difficult question. I think if you look at it from, if you look, for example, to the Netherlands, the Netherlands is bound, as all the other member states, to certain environmental objectives. So you could argue that each and every state organ is obliged to help where possible from a legal perspective. Of course, the question is, yeah, should we integrate this into competition law? Yes or no. And there's also an issue of democracy. Because who is the, 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 who is the Dutch competition authority? Who is the commission to decide what we should and what we should not integrate? Is it part of their mandate? You've got very similar questions, for example, when it comes to the ACB. Yeah, they focus on sustainability as well. But is it even part of the legal mandate? There's a lot of discussion about that. It's actually a very similar uh, uh, discussion. Um, and... Uh, um, um, Yes, so I would say the main issue is that negative externalities to uh, the environment cannot just be recovered, uh, uh, sorry, negative externalities by consumers can, can not, cannot be remedied uh, 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 by just looking at consumer preferences. They are not always, and in most instances, they're not willing to pay for the environment, environmental damage that they create. Uh, and, and that's the reason why Martijn Snoep at the ACM uh, went on his crusade to include sustainability into the fair share criterion in Article 101, uh, uh, third paragraph. Yeah, is it up to the ACM to do so? Well, what the ACM basically <laughs> said is the ideal situation would be that there would be regulation. The only thing is regulation that's anti-competitive, but then transformed into a law, uh, uh, breaches primary EU law, because you're basically helping to avoid the proper usage of competition law. 
So that's the reason why the Dutch rule on sustainability uh, agreements never really came into being because the, uh, the, the Dutch Conseil d'État, the, they gave a very critical appraisal under EU law. So that's a little bit difficult. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Pim. Thank you very much, Rogier, and also Niels and Sarah for the wonderful papers and presentations. We have exactly 20 minutes now for coffee break. That will take place outside here or maybe down just outside here, downstairs. Wonderful. And then you have to get back uh, sharp at 11.15 for the next session. 2.1 is here in this room, which is called Statenzaal. 2.2 is in 13.08, which is just very close here. So make sure that Kalpana will also guide you that you're there at 11.15. Coffee now. Good. Ja, ik heb het